What's up guys, Houndish here and we're jumping in today with some Destiny 2 news and we've got updates from Bungie regarding bugs this season, missing roadmaps and the devs talk about future subclass changes in new interview segments. But additionally we're going to talk about the 30th anniversary launch date, a secret PvP intro, as well as new Festival of the Lost content for 2021. And we'll round up new secrets in the game this week, a preview of the exotic vault, plus more inside of the video. But before we get into it guys, we've got a brand new deal with Loot Crate, and they make awesome crates filled with bundles of collectibles, figures, apparel, and more. They've got ones for Destiny, like this moon-themed crate that they sent to me, but they introduce new ones every three months as part of their subscription service, with awesome exclusive goodies that you can't get anywhere else. They also have a ton of other crate themes to subscribe to, and right now you can save 15% on orders using code HOUNDISH15. So if you want to check out their Destiny crates, or any of the other themes they have in the store, be sure to follow the link below and use the code at checkout. But now, getting into the news for today, Bungie Help tweeted initially, and they said we've issued a server-side fix to resolve a problem where Tier 3 focused Umbral Engrams had no weekly limit. And so you may see a limit on those now where there wasn't one previously. Something rather interesting right here, but Destiny Newscom tweeted, and apparently there is a bug right now with Briggs, Ogres, Wyverns, and a few other enemies in the game, which is causing those enemies to rapid fire, essentially. We can see right here this brig going absolutely crazy. And Cosmo did say that the team are taking a look at what's going on. May not be something you run into, but it's bound to be interesting if you do. Up next though, a lot of people have been asking, are we going to get a roadmap for this season? And for some reason it hasn't been revealed yet, so DMG said it looks like we'll have one in the next few weeks. Stay tuned. And so I'm not sure why that is, but there should still be one at some point for you guys who've been wondering. Another quick shout right here, but other folks have been asking about the release date for the 30th anniversary pack. And according to the stores at least, that should be on December the 7th. So that's the day where we're going to get the return of Galahorn from the new dungeon inside of the Cosmodrome, the Thorn-styled armor set, and a bunch of other cosmetics. And so that'll be something to look forward to a bit later on in the year. Moving on though, Rogard shared a secret intro that can play inside of the Crucible, and at the moment it's believed to be a rare easter egg, which possibly only displays if you have less than a full team. Nobody's 100% certain on how it actually displays yet, but we can see right here this was their Crucible intro screen where the player at the front is actually facing the wrong way and then turns around and awkwardly nods at the teammates. Quite amusing, but also quite rare, so let us know if you've spotted the secret PvP intro in the game. Final quick shout right here, and a mild spoiler alert, but Destiny Newscom on Twitter pointed out that Festival of the Lost 2021 might be adding Haunted Lost Sectors. And so there's an objective for the event, don your favourite mask and collect treats as you brave the new haunted sectors in remembrance of those we've lost. And so it seems like that's going to be a thing for the event this year. And on top of other rewards that have yet to be revealed, it'll certainly be interesting to get a new gameplay element for the event. Moving on though, new content in the game for this week includes the new Shattered Realm bubble, the Debris of Dreams, and this does have Ascendant Anchors and Chests to collect, as well as the first run awarding us with the True Sight Compass upgrade, where lanterns now reveal hidden passages, so it should be even easier to find secrets now. And the story quest for the week does conclude with a neat dialogue section from Savathun. But we also have new locations for Atlas skews in Tracing the Stars 2, and once again they're in the Dreaming City, so starting in the Strand, we've got one on top of the very large statue near where the public event spawns. So head up on top of the statue and you can grab the first one. And then from this position, if we look towards the gazebo where Petra can spawn, jump down and head in that direction, and then head to the left hand side of the gazebo and round the back, where we can find the second skew. The third one's pretty easy to find and is in Aphelion's Rest, the Lost Sector located beneath the island that we're on. So head down into the Lost Sector and just above the final chest after you defeat the boss, we can find the third skew for the week. And then we need to head to the Garden of Isilla. So heading back out into the Strand area, we need to take the road uphill and follow it all the way up to the gardens. And the first skew is at the Garden Waterfall, so that one's fairly easy to find. And from here, we can just jump onto the bridge, where at the end, we find the final skew for the week. When we return to the Caliburn Gatehouse, we get some dialogue related to the backstory of Aegis Scepter, and two Awoken characters linked to the legacy of the weapon. The twin kestrels darted through the gaps between branches. The leaves formed verdant pathways. Predictably, Riga first, with Agar close behind. In those pathways, they traded secrets. Secrets Riga whispered to the flock, hoping to push them beyond the hollow, beyond the forest. 
Most nights, Riga and Agar sat beneath the stars to dream. Twin hearts sounding a duet of beats. Like ours, Mara. I still feel yours. Still distant. In this story, Agar fixated on the dark clouded pox that marred the night above the canopy. He pointed to the starry spaces between them and asked his sister to name them. Riga never spoke a word. She already knew all their names and didn't want to crush his spirit. How cheerful. One night, Agar grew impatient of her silence and pointed to one of the dark spots as it roared with thunder. The storm is singing to us, said Agar. We should sing back to show it we are not afraid. Riga wove her voice with his, and the thunder resounded. She did not sing with him again after that night. Rare to see stars in the ascendant plane. I wish we were doing this together. Why hide the scepter if it weren't a test? I understand Awoken history is not your strong suit, Titan. I will teach you. When the Awoken people came into being after the Collapse, I was the first. As first, my chosen form defined what an Awoken could be. Thousands followed my example, willing themselves into existence within the Distributary. Some, like Aldrin, required help. His mind was like an unsteady form. No surprise he was unable to do it on his own. So I guided him, filled the gaps in his memory. I gave him a star to follow. He was bonded to me, and his devotion spiraled into pathetic recklessness. Even through death, he hasn't outgrown that dependency. I see it in him as he looks longingly to his ghost for answers. To you. An additional spoiler alert is necessary here, but JB3 just posted a video showing the vault where the new exotic is stored. Obviously, this has been accessed early in some way, but if you do want to see it, I'll link JB3's video down below. Speaking of Season of the Lost quests, Lurky posted to Reddit with extra details about the Aegis Scepter exotic and its perks. So a spoiler alert is absolutely necessary right here, but the two main perks for the weapon appear to be Aegis Call, where final blows with the weapon will slow nearby targets, but also Rhaegar's Refrain and the trait reads Drain Super Energy, overflowing the magazine and empowering the beam with bonus damage, and the ability to slow and freeze targets until the magazine or Super Energy runs out. It'll also run out when the weapon is stowed, and it can only be activated when Super Energy is full. And so essentially we'll be able to spend our super on actually supercharging the weapon giving it bonus damage and also overflowing the magazine for continuous fire. It certainly sounds like that could be pretty interesting. They also point out that obliterating destructible walls in the Shattered Realm will grant additional progress for the weapon's catalyst. And so it is going to be pretty exciting once again when we finally get access to that weapon and I'll be curious to get any thoughts from you guys below. Finally though, right here we get some interesting interview segments about future subclass changes from Polygon. But first, Ryan Gilliam at Polygon also points out that we are going to see a raid or dungeon every three months starting as of Witch Queen. So, Joe Blackburn and Justin Truman revealed at the end of the showcase stream that the Witch Queen expansion will include two dungeons coming in year five. But they also revealed that Bungie will remaster a second classic raid from Destiny 1. And that's on top of the fact that we get a new raid in the Witch Queen expansion. So between Witch Queen and the following expansion, we're going to see at least two raids, one new and one reprised, and then two dungeons. And assuming that content is spread out across the course of the year, we should pretty much get either a dungeon or a raid on every season inside of year five, which is pretty cool. Let us know which D1 dungeon you'd like to see returning down in the comment section. But next, he has some interview segments with Justin Truman and Joe Blackburn about the Void 3.0 subclass changes. And he points out that some players may have had concerns or questions about what we might lose in the conversion to the new kind of subclass system. And the Bungie dev said, there are no plans right now for players to lose anything substantial in the conversion. If you're talking about something like Nova Warp, or if you're talking about something like Spectral Blades, we want to make sure all of that is there. 
One of the things we're really passionate about is that when players log in on day one of the Witch Queen and they're exploring Void 3.0, that they don't feel like a bunch of stuff got taken away. Kevin Yanis on Twitter also confirmed that the studio has no plans to remove Nova Warp. However, he points out, as Bungie mentioned in the last blog post, some things will still change with the conversion. And Joe Blackburn said some of our melees in some of the existing trees and some of our passives weren't as exciting, and some of those are things that they've decided are okay to lose. And to Polygon say, players who expect every passive and melee in the game to move over may be disappointed. But Joe Blackburn finished by saying it's really important that, for us, when you log in on day one, you don't feel like Bungie have taken a bunch of stuff away. That's a huge non-goal for us. And they also clarified that players won't need to re-earn their abilities through quests the way that we had to with stasis aspects and fragments. So we're not going to have to re-earn any void abilities. Everything that we currently have and is being kind of adjusted or consolidated in the update will still be available to us in that new subclass format. And Justin Truman said the feeling of the year after Witch Queen launches is going to be really different from the feeling of any previous year that we've rolled out in terms of the amount of evolution that players will see. Not just to things like the weapon meta, but to your fundamental abilities, I think it's going to be a higher bar than we've hit on any previous year. And so they are making some pretty big promises for the Destiny year that will begin with Witch Queen. But important highlights are that some things, some minor abilities and lesser used elements may be adjusted with this subclass update. However, primary super abilities and things that are kind of major elements of subclasses right now are likely to carry over. And once again, we're not going to have to re-earn that stuff, which is very important as well. I'll link that full interview down below though if you want to check it out. However, for today, guys, that that's what we have to round up inside of this video. So as always, I hope you have enjoyed it. And if you have, a like rating down below really helps us out on the channel. Also, if you are new to the channel, be sure to get subscribed and turn on notifications. I will be keeping you posted on all of the Season of the Lust stuff, as well as the upcoming Witch Queen expansion. So also be sure to turn on notifications if you don't want to miss out on any content. But for now, guys, I very much appreciate you tuning in and hope you all have an awesome day.